This week's message, given by Pastor Stephen Yun at the Second Sunday United Methodist Church, February 26, 2023. The message is, Empowered to be a God's Poet, based on Psalm 2, 1-12, and Acts 4, 23-31. Moving on to our scripture readings for today. The first one is taken from Psalms, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, your rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son and he will be angry, and your way will lead to your destruction, for his wrath can flare up in any moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Our second scripture reading is taken from Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 31. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plots in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God, of God boldly. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks to God. Thank you, God. Amen. It's good to be with you this morning. Would you join me as I pray? Loving, gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for this day. We thank you for this privilege to come together and worship you with our beloved church family. As we worship this morning, send us your Holy Spirit. We kindle in our hearts the flames of revival, the flames of your love, so that we can continue to be your hands and feet in our lives and our world. Inspire us with your word through the scriptures. Help us to see the truth that you would like to 
share with us this morning. May the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. How many of you love poems? Anybody love poems? Yeah. Do you have a, uh, your favorite poet? One of my favorite poems is actually the world's shortest poem written by the Aram Saroyan, an Armenian-American poet and novelist. As you can expect, his poem was uh, cited in the Guinness Book of Records. I brought the poem here so you can read it. Here's the poem. <laughs> yes. What is it, right? As you can expect, you know. Uh, look, like, look, look like an M, right? You see why it's a world's uh, shortest poem, right? It's a one word. Looks like a one word, right? Looks like an alphabet M, but actually it's three legged, right? What do you see in this poem, friends? As you read and see this poem, how do you read it? Our choice? Oh, arch. Okay. Yeah? I'm sorry? I am, exactly, yeah, that's a good discovery. What else? Cemetery. A cemetery, okay, I'm sorry. I was thinking of the uh, church cemetery. It looks, it looks like a code, sort of, right? In this poem, people see different things, and some say, you know, it's a M plus M. N. Some of our Sunday school children who love chocolate might think of M&M, &M, right? Yeah, yeah. Some little children might see it as a bug or a caterpillar, you know? How do you read it, though, if it's a poem? How do you interpret it? The meaning of it has been subjected to discussion. Some indicated that it describes the sound people make. Mm -hmm. Like when you figure out something, right? Mm -hmm. Or when you're surprised. It can apply to any situation. So what this means is the meaning of this poem varies depending on how you feel, what's going on at the moment. Some people interpret this poem as a pun uh, on I am, like uh, you said, Linda, I am. I am. Implying the formation of our human consciousness. As a pastor, I interpret it uh, from a faith perspective. To me, this poem is like uh, God saying the famous self-revelation in the, um, one of the Old Testament stories. You know, when Moses, a Moses asked the question, what should I tell people who sent me? And, and God's response was the famous I am who I am, which is the meaning of God's name, Yahweh. I am who I am. This poem also reminds me of Jesus who made a series of I am statements in the Gospels. I am the living water. I am the sheep of the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the life, the way, the truth, and the life. This is why I like this poem. This world's shortest poem demonstrates most strikingly the power of a poem and what a poem can do through their work. 
Every time you read it, you come to feel something new. You come to learn something new. You come to see something new. In a sense, poetry is like painting. It's like a paint. It's like a. It's like a painting. You know, they're both forms of art, but one is written, and the other is painted. Like the painter、uh, Lessie said, the painting and poetry are similar in the way that they make absent things present. Both poetry and painting make absent things present. So, based on this、uh, connection between poetry and painting, here is my favorite definition of. A poet. The poet is one who paints color of our experience and existence with words. This is my favorite one because it's my own definition. Here's a blank、uh, page that represents our daily life. You know, after you wake up in the morning. You do、uh, things according to your schedule, and by the end of the day, you are just like this paper. The page of your life will be filled with so many stuff, you know, so many activities, so many feelings, thoughts, joy and sadness, hope and despair. Gratitude and ingratitude, laughter and crying, love and hate, just like this paper, it's like this page. The page of your life will be filled with so many stuff. What a poet does is to color the page, like this. You color the page, which means you give meaning to your experience and existence. We humans are meaning-making creatures, meaning-seeking creatures. What this means is that making or seeking meaning are at the core of our experience and existence. Meaning-making is at the core of what we do as a human. It's only through the meaning that we make sense of our existence. And writing a poem is one way of finding meaning, seeking meaning in this world that seems chaotic and out of order. It's an attempt to give ourselves a sense of order in this world of disorderliness. It makes absent things present and visible. And a poet is one who knows that the reality of our world is not as happy, promising, and pretty as described in the beautiful language of poems. There's a Danish、uh, Christian philosopher, theologian, Jaren Kierkegaard, who pointedly captured the heart of what a poet is. A poet is an unhappy person who conceals profound anguish in his heart, but whose lips are so formed that as sighs and cries pass over them, they sound like a beautiful music. What a pointed definition of what poet is! Interestingly, we encounter those unhappy but divinely inspired poets in the Bible. Especially the book called the Psalms, the Book of Psalms, which lies at the center of the Bible. So, if you have the Bible, try to find the Psalms where they where they are located. They are at the center of the Bible, and Psalms are a collection of poems and songs and prayers of God's people, God's poet, throughout the centuries. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit and written in poetic language. And these psalms were written by many people, you know, 
Uh, a lot of Psalms were written by King David, as, as, as you know. And also the Solomon, Moses, and other biblical figures we know. In today's scripture reading, Psalm 2, we heard the psalmist describe a world where the order established by God is in a state of chaos. As the king of earth are planning to rebel against God's rule and reign, the psalmist cries out. It's quite resonating with what we are experiencing in today's world. Today's world of, of national, global politics. As we read the book of Psalms, we see these God's poets from the ancient times pointedly reveal the anatomy of our broken world. As we see them pour out their true being and feelings genuinely, we come to face the true condition of our heart, our soul, filled with sadness and grief, despair, jealousy, doubt, fear, hate, and anger, even anger toward God. We come to confess our sins as we see them confess their sins, saying, O oh God, clean, create in me a pure heart. Our spirit is lifted as we see them praise and worship the Lord. Sing hallelujah, let us make a joyful noise before the Lord. We come to realize the true source of our strength is our God as we see them ask God to help in times of trouble, saying, Oh God, you are my refuge, my fortress, my rock of salvation, constant presence in times of trouble. As we read the Psalms, we hear the calming voice of God that the psalmist heard, Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 46. You know, as we read these psalms, we find ourselves experiencing the whole range of human experiences and emotions which we are dealing with in our everyday life as well. They're not just the con conditions of the psalmist. It is our own conditions as well. Well, it's true that while many people have the capacity for expressions, not everyone identifies themselves as a poet. But we all have a certain condition in our hearts and our lives to express in our own words, from our own perspectives, from the standpoint of faith. And this is why we explore how we explore and make sense of the world around us as we uh, communicate our own unique perspective and insights. In this regard, I agree with Robert Frost a lot. I'm using a lot of, um, I'm sorry, going back. Definitions uh, from a po poet. I agree with Robert Frost who said, to be a poet is a condition, not a profession. To be a poet is, is a condition, not a profession. And if being a poet is about our conditions, this means that we all can be a poet in a sense. As Christians, we bring faith into our condition, our human condition, being empowered to be God's poet, whatever circumstances we're dealing with in our lives today. During this Lent, we will be engaging a worship series based on Barb Bruce's book, Finding Jesus in the Psalms. Finding Jesus in the Psalms. We can find the word of Jesus in the Psalms. You, you cannot find the word Jesus in the Psalms. So what does it mean to find Jesus in the Psalms? And why do we have to find Jesus in the Psalms? These are the questions that we're going to deal with in our Lenten study going forward. But while theologians have been... Uh, studying this topic, you know, and they were taking this from a very different approaches. And they were trying to uh, present the principles of biblical interpretation regarding 
a Christ in the Psalms. How do we see Jesus in the Psalms, and what does it mean to find Jesus in the Psalms, which is in the Old Testament, right? Before Jesus came, it was written. I mentioned Psalm 2 earlier as an example of what the psalmist centered. You know, the psalmist was concerned with uh, the rulers of the earth. In verse 1, it says, Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? In verse 1, the use of the words nations and people implies that all people are seeking to overthrow God's established order. The rebellion is not just against God, but also against the anointed one, the Messiah, God's Messiah, according to Psalm 2. And the psalmist makes a striking point in this psalm that in this face of terrifying threats, God creates and preserves order through God's anointed one, the Messiah, the righteous Messiah. As we read the book of, from the book of Acts this morning, the chapter 4, that's how Peter and John approached the Psalm 2. You know, they were citing Psalm 2 as they were preaching to the priest and the Jewish leaders. And they found Jesus in the ancient Psalm written by King David. In her book, Barb Bruce writes, from the beginning of the scriptures in Genesis through the final pages of Revelation, Jesus is God's answer to our greatest questions and path to hope, peace, redemption through our greatest pain. So what it means to find Jesus in the psalm is we find that strength, that hope, that redemption, that peace, as we read the Psalms. Where do we find those as we read the, the book of Psalms? That will be the question for us during this Lenten journey. This past Wednesday, we observed Ash Wednesday, which makes the beginning of our Lenten season, as I mentioned in the beginning. And I invited uh, the congregation to practice Silence, to observe the discipline of silence throughout this Lenten season. If you missed it, I invite you to take uh, time to hear the message, what it means to practice silence as a spiritual discipline. In line with the practice of silence, there are two spiritual exercises I will encourage you to practice during this Lenten season. Two spiritual exercises that I would like to encourage you to practice. First, I encourage you to write a spiritual poem, like Psalms. And of course, writing is always shaped by our reading. Writing a spiritual poem begins with reading Psalms. I invite you to read a Psalm per day. Try to read a psalm per day, starting with a psalm first, Psalm 1. And I know for many of us, psalms can be an intimidating book. You know, uh, it's, as the largest book in the Bible, the psalms include a, a great variety of materials, and some of which feels familiar, but others feel disconcerting and also depressing, even uh, a troubling to, to continue to read. But again, the book of Psalms can guide us into a deep, deep and genuine relationship with God. So, I invite you to read a psalm in the morning as you begin your day and meditate on it as you drive, walk, eat, take a rest during the day. As you read the psalm each day, think about your day in light of the psalm you read. What does it say about your own experience? How can your particular moment in your life be seen from a faith perspective? As a God's poet, how would you put them into words? 
It doesn't have to be the most sophisticated, delicate words, poetic words. But I trust the Holy Spirit will give you the words and guide you through the process of putting your thoughts into the words, the most appropriate language. As we're going, uh, as a church, we're going to undertake a project. We will uh, create the acrostic poem. Do you know what acrostic poem is? For example, candy we make an acrostic poem like this: chocolate addicting, never get enough, delicious, yummy. Something like this. Okay. We start with each alphabet and creates a. Uh, you know, the poem. So, uh, two years ago, our church family created this poem, acrostic poem, based on uh, the Bible study, the Proverbs Bible study. Started with alphabet A through Z. So we shared this with the Sunday school children before. So this is the uh, acrostic poem, and I invite you to um, think about these alphabets, finding Jesus throughout this Lenten season. If we create uh, this acrostic poem, uh, let's say, work on two words per week, we will be able to finish by the end of this Lenten season. So this, during, the, during this week, think about the poem that you would like to express, especially F and I. And bring that idea to the church next week. F I. You will get the uh, constant contact email this week for uh, as a reminder. But think about what expression would you like to put using the alphabet F and I. And the next week will be N and D. Okay. So we'll continue to work on this uh, acrostic poem as a church, as as a church act, church church uh, project. Second, I encourage you to color the psalms. What? Coloring? Some of you might think that that's just for the children, right? But, um, you know, actually it's been practiced by many adult Christians these days. And some people, I know some of our church family do that still. You, while you put color to the page to create your unique artwork, you read and reflect and meditate on the scriptures. So we print this out for you to take home. This is a Psalm 2. They're available in the back of the sanctuary on the table. So please take some. This is Psalm 2. As you are coloring, you read the scripture okay, and meditate on it. You color them and you meditate on them at the same time. Here is um, Psalm 46 that I mentioned. Be still and know that I am God. As you color them, meditate on them. Meditate on the words. So this will be... Uh, the project for our uh, church as well during this Lenten season. I invite you to take this coloring page and then work on it, bring it back the following Sunday. We're going to place a basket there so you can place them there. And we will display them on Easter Sunday. At, at the end of this Lenten journey, we're going to share this artwork with our church family. And I'm going to practice as well. You know, I'm going to uh, color them as well each week. And, and if, if any of you are willing to do it together during the week, we can create a small group even. We can create a group as well. So the only rule would be to keep silent while coloring the image and meditating on the Psalms and share at the end together. So during this Lenten season, we are challenged to find Jesus through these spiritual disciplines, spiritual exercises, not only in the Psalms, but also in our everyday life. 
Friends, where can we find Jesus? Where can you find Jesus in your life today? I invite you to take this challenge. Find Jesus not only in the Psalms, but also in your everyday life. Amen?